how we follow that, really, <laughs> but uh, we'll try. Uh, welcome, everybody, to COGEX. I uh, hope you're wrapped up well. Um, here we go. We're going to open the ethics stage. So everyone here probably knows that data sets are biased. Everyone here probably knows that gendering voice assistance has consequences. Everyone here probably knows that facial recognition can be discriminatory. And everyone here probably knows that there aren't enough minority groups or women working in AI. Yet a live person survey revealed that 53% of respondents had never even thought about why voice assistants are projected as female, although 85% of them did know that female voices were the default. And recent Element AI Lab research highlights that still only around 12% of AI researchers are women. So the gender and other discriminatory effects of AI are not perhaps as widely known as those of us here might think. But even where they are widely known, things have yet to be fixed. We're not here today, however, to rehearse these problems. We're here instead to tell you what we think people like us, humanities and social science academics, can help to do about addressing them. And we isn't just Clemmie and I. So back in February, on a much nicer day than this, at the University of Cambridge, the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence held a workshop on AI and gender. This was convened with the Ada Lovelace Institute and supported by PwC. The workshop was what we call transdisciplinary and transsectoral. So it gathered scholars from a whole range of academic disciplines, and it brought researchers and practitioners from industry and research centers outside of academia, as well as key figures in UK AI governance and policy. And over the course of the day, 17 10-minute talks created a wide and detailed picture of the cutting edge of current research and initiatives into AI and gender. This created lots of agreement, some disagreement, a lot of conversation, and a very interesting and quite phenomenal buzz. So we wanted to take advantage of that communal energy at the end of the day when we invited our participants to take part in a collective intelligence exercise. Their challenge was to come up with at least three recommendations for new areas of research concerning AI and gender. And the result of that challenge our Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence report, AI and Gender for Proposals for Future Research. The report's currently in press to be launched at CFI's annual Maggie Bowden lecture on the 18th of June, but we're here today to give you guys a sneak preview. So the AI and Gender report is a collective enterprise and it outlines four of the weightiest challenges to gender equality presented by recent developments in AI. In tandem, um, it outlines four academic research proposals which we think would effectively contribute to tackling these issues. The aim of the report is to be informative, but primarily it seeks to be provocative for academics, research funders, the public and industry to act on these issues. Our proposals are not intended to be prescriptive, but to serve as a call to action to address AI and injustice. Another important point to raise is that although the report focuses on gender rather than race, ethnicity or sexuality, we recognize the inseparability of these issues. Um, so the report advocates for research to strive to be intersectional, pluralistic, interdisciplinary and transsectoral, which is why it's so appropriate for us to be telling you about it at an event like COGEX. Throughout um, the report, we acknowledge scholars, organizations, and institutions which are currently effectively tackling particular issues, and we aim to keep all work in this field collaborative. The ambition is that the research proposals outlined in the report will be viewed as a tool which incorporates and complements existing work, while highlighting the areas that still require investigation. In addition, although this work situates examples mainly in the UK context, we advocate that research should be as international as possible. So each of the proposals begins by summarizing the issues which we're currently facing, and then it lays out kinds of research that's needed in order to address these issues. So we indicate methods, aims, values, and challenges of the research. So we want to give you a kind of flavor of, of what these research proposals consist of. 
So uh, the first topic, we've split it into four research themes. The first is what we've called bridging gender theory and AI practice. So technological design often captures and reproduces controlling and restri restrictive conceptions of gender and race, which are then repetitively reinforced. And there's a very interesting parallel between technology's insistence on repeating particular actions and the roots of gender in a repetitive social performance. And these two things reinforce the restrictive mechanisms of the gender binary and of racial hierarchies. We look at three notable AI systems or aspects of systems which repetitively reproduce controlling and restrictive conceptions of gender and race. Humanoid robotics, virtual personal assistance, and gendered epistemology, gendered knowledge. So in order to address these issues, we propose that research which uses gender theory, and this includes trans theory, non-binary, queer, feminist, and post-colonial theory, to explore the fundamental barriers to equality embedded in the design and purpose of AI technologies. And we note that although feminist theory has, has already been applied to technological practice, it has been criticized by trans writers for ignorance of trans lives. So the use of gender theory needs to be broadened. The, this research, we suggest, would also include and pursue multilateral conversation with international stakeholders, technologists, and designers. It would seek to understand the conceptions and definitions of gender and race that they use, and why and how those conceptions are being embedded into technological design. And we think this is crucial, because there's no point us just going to them and telling them what we think. We need to listen to their views in order to figure out how theory can speak to practice. Bridging the gap between gender theory and AI practice would require then synthesizing these two strands, the theoretical work and the communication work, to produce research-based practical tools. These would be employed and incorporated into the way in which these technologies are designed and used in society. These tools could inform the technological process at all stages, as well as the more political aspects of technological creation. Importantly, we think this research should also explore where systems should not be deployed or where they would be inappropriate in the context of the aim of social justice. So law and policy um, is the second research theme. Um, law and policy surrounding AI is currently at the embryonic stage of development. Um, just this month, the high-level expert group um, on AI for the EU will put forward policy and investment recommendations about how to strengthen Europe's competitiveness in AI. Um, kind of just picking up on this, the development of AI um, is often associated with economic growth and intensified political power. And there is concern that these motivations will play an underlying role in shaping laws and policies on AI at the expense of other more socially equalizing motivations. Um, there has been an abundance of work on ethical codes which should inform our technological practice by holding human values at the heart of development. But there's been little work on how this could be translated into policy and legislation. It goes without saying, though, that, of course, these structures will play an absolutely crucial role in shaping how um, AI like, integrates into our societies. So the AI and gender report proposes that there's a need for research which analyzes existing and emerging legislation and policy relating to AI and gender. Specifically, we suggest this research could include analysis of policies surrounding data and privacy, technological design, and labor. Those are the three areas we suggest. These areas of policy are currently being worked on in relation to AI, more generally speaking, um, but would benefit from additional gender-based research. So laws and poli policies, we suggest, could be analysed through two mechanisms. The first is legal gender theory. This could be used to consider how policy and legislation can facilitate AI policy makers. Second, interviews with technologists, experts and policy makers would function as a way to gain mutual understanding between policy makers and technologists regarding the definitions of gender and how vulnerable gender groups would be impacted by certain structural changes. This evidence would inform the formulation of research-based, gender-specific recommendations regarding particular policies. Additionally, we call for a set of guidelines for ongoing policy development which would outline certain standards to be upheld when designing and implementing new policy and legislation 
which both directly and indirectly impacts issues surrounding AI and gender equality. So I opened, and this is our third strand, um, bias data sets. I opened with noting that data sets are often unrepresentative of the public demographic. And there's a high level of data deprivation when it comes to capturing minority groups. Bias data sets amplify gender and racial inequality and project past and present biases into the future. This is what Caroline Criado Perez's recent book, Invisible Women, refers to as the gender data gap. Whiteness and maleness not only dominate our data sets, but they cause skews in them. In addition, those data sets can also be disproportionately targeted at minority groups. So our report proposes that the collection, handling, and purpose of large data sets needs to be further explored and exposed with regard to how it's perpetuating gender and racial bias and discrimination. And we do note in the challenges that there's, a, there's an issue of access here which will need to be negotiated. Ethical guidelines relating to AI are often non-context specific, premised on some kind of one-size-fits-all approach. But we suggest the need for research which results in context-specific, gender-specific guidelines for best practice regarding data. These contexts would include, we suggest, crime and policing technologies, health technologies, and financial sector technologies. These three areas exhibit multiple instances where data sets can result in significant bias and where more work needs to be done to enhance gender equality through data equality. Guidelines would cover data collection, data handling, and subject-specific trade-offs. Prior to these, setting these guidelines, the report suggests that there's another theoretical aspect needed, which is to investigate and align definitions of fairness. So there's the definition of fairness from the perspective of gender equality, but there's also technical definitions of fairness. And research needs to be done specifically in relation to historical and current gender issues and tensions and to use sources such as context-specific studies, gender theory, we really get the challenge here, aren't we? The weather and now the helicopters. Um, gender theory and the fairness tool audit. In parallel to this research, finally, there's a need for research which analyzes the underlying societal issues in relation to these data biases. And this is where the social science comes in. This would look to identify the root causes of these issues. For example, why are certain pockets of society not being captured in current data sets? Or why are particular industries collecting and handling data in a discriminatory way? So our fourth and final research theme is diversity in the AI workforce. So currently, only 7% of students studying computer science and 17% of those working in technology in the UK are female. Um, the current pipeline doesn't promise a better balance in the future. Last year, PwC did a survey of 2,000 A-level students in the UK. Um, only 3% of this sample said they would pick technology as their first choice at university, which is no surprise considering only 6% had had it suggested to them as a career option. Diversification of the AI workforce will be vital in order to design and implement technology which is equitable. Those involved in designing future technologies are dictating and framing how society functions. Diversity is important because it brings to the table deliberation and additionally, a lack of diversity exhibited by an unvarying workforce alienates those who are not consistent with this image. At the current rate, existing inequalities will only be aggravated and enlarged by an AI labour market which fails to reflect a diverse population. This report advocates that there is a need for research which, firstly, investigates the psychological factors surrounding diversity in STEM education and the AI labour market. This would explore biases from both sides, looking at what factors motivate women and minority groups to pursue these subjects or occupations, and what biases impede diversity in the industry through things like application processes and subconscious bias in the process of recruitment. The report suggests that this could be done through a combination of both qualitative and quantitative research, so that the data can be analysed to discover any causal inferences between the main statistical bottlenecks and the psychological or cultural reasons for these barriers. So the quantitative data collection, we suggest, could take place in schools, universities and workplaces to gather a wide range of data concerning different points in the pipeline. 
Um, the qualitative data we suggest could be collected through focus groups in schools and universities, and this would allow students to kind of share their experiences of subjects and teaching and institutional culture. Um, and we also suggest the use of surveys and discourse analysis in organisations in order to look at, um, as I said, things like recruitment processes, um, promotion systems and workplace culture. Secondly, we suggest that there's a need for research which explores mechanisms to embed a culture of diversity. Um, when it comes to eliminating bias, there tends to be a certain reliance upon balancing numbers of people in the room. Um, and we, we note in this report that although this is definitely important, um, research should also consider how to create a sustainable culture of diversity, which can be embedded in educational institutions and in the workplace. Um, thirdly and lastly in this section, we suggest there's a need to audit the current initiatives which are aiming to address this imbalance in education and careers in STEM and AI. Inspired by the work of Iris Bonnet, we argue for the use of randomised control trials to point to how these initiatives are having the greatest impact. And this would also give an indication of how interventions could be altered to optimise their impact. So as we embark upon rapid technological development, now is the moment to address these issues. Our report consolidates the aims of that AI and gender workshop back in February. It scopes and situates current research and interventions. It identifies where further research and interventions are required. It refines the nature of the relationship between AI and gender, and it acts as a call to action to tackle injustice. All, or some of this at least, can be done by academics, but we can't do this alone, and we can't do it without collaboration or indeed without funding. We want to collaborate, and that's why being in spaces like COGX are so important moving forwards. To end, though, we want to look backwards for a moment. In a BBC lecture in 1954, in which he called attention to the global threats of his day, such as nuclear weapons, the Cambridge philosopher Bertrand Russell claimed, all equally are in peril. And if the peril is understood, there is hope that we may collectively avert it. All? equally are in peril, at least in relation to AI, that's not quite true. Research into AI and gender, into AI and race, is crucial in order to expose the ways in which we are not all equally in peril. That's a very deceptive pronoun, we. In 2015, the late Stephen Hawking used it when commenting on AI. He said the real risk with AI isn't malice, but competence. A super intelligent AI will be extremely good at accomplishing its goals. And if those goals aren't allow, aligned with ours, we are in trouble. Who is this our? Who is this we? And is it really so clear what our goals might be? The real risk with AI to adapt Hawking's comment is not malice, nor even competence, but the fact that the we whose data informs it, the we who design it, the we who implement or regulate it, the hour of our shared goals are all implied to be universal, but actually denote a very small subset of the world's population. Research into the different gendered effects of AI technologies, the reasons for them and how to fix all this, is urgently needed if it's not just going to be some of us who are going to be in peril in an AI future. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to hand over now to my colleague, Dr. Kanta Dihal, um, who is going to chair a panel discussion which will pick up some of these themes and hopefully expand and explore beyond them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. So um, I'm Kanta Dihal. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. Um, I lead uh, the research projects Global AI Narratives and Decolonizing AI. And as Sarah said, we are going to be um, discussing some of those uh, issues just mentioned a bit more in depth um, from the perspectives of different sectors. I'm Gina Neff. I'm a professor at the Oxford Internet Institute and in the Department of Sociology at Oxford. And my issue really is I'm starting to work on how technology and AI influence work, workers, and workplaces. 
Hello, I'm Maria Accente from PwC. I work in the uh, Center of Excellence and I advise clients on the build of ethical, responsible AI. I also coordinate the firm's efforts in AI for me. Hi everyone, my name is Carly Kind. I am soon to be the director of the Ada Lovelace Institute, which is a body dedicated to ensuring that AI works for people and society. Thank you. So, um, We've just heard uh, four research themes outlined by Clemmie and Sarah, and which of these stands out to you as the most important for your specific sector, and why? I want to just take up and amplify something that they emphasize in the report, which is AI has the capacity to repeat, perpetuate, and introduce new kinds of gender biases, and I think that that provides us in Sarah's charge, <laughs> um, an opportunity to really think about what kinds of values, goals, and objectives are getting built into technologies today that will really influence social conditions tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's the diversity in the work workforce is really important. And then we should actually contextualize where AI is going to operate because we are placing it in, in organizational context that are far more complex than we think they are. So mm -hmm. when we talk about workforce, we should not only um, think about the technical skills, we should be thinking of everyone who is helping shape those technology from business <coughs> analysts to translators to um, um, the, the, the tester itself. And I think that that's, you know, looking at the pipeline and the, the, the findings of the report and the fact that the pipeline takes time um, to populate, we have to be patient. We have to look at how can we boost that diversity in other means, not just looking at the value chain and mm -hmm. in early education. Is there any way we can address it with existing workforce? Do we have mm -hmm. to, you know, prepare and upskill the existing workforce for gender-related issues? I think I think it's important to have a bit of open mind and diverse look at. Uh, boosting the workforce in AI. Mm -hmm. I build on what Maria says. I think having women in the room at every stage has to be at least a starting point. And acknowledging what Sarah and Clemmie said, it's not enough, it's not mm -hmm. sufficient, but it's essential prerequisite. Um, two stories come to mind to, to, to demonstrate that. The first is in Caroline Creator Perez's book, Invisible Women, she talks about a mathematician, Dinah Taimina, who was uh, the first to look at hyperbolic planes and realized that she could um, uh, demonstrate what a hyperbolic plane looks like through crochet, which was something that she had grown up doing. And she opened up the eyes of scientists and mathematicians to think about how to uh, design and illustrate a hyperbolic plane in a new way, and in essentially a, a way that only a woman can do because she had mm. the experience in a you know, traditionally feminine craft. And it made me think about Ada Lovelace herself, um, the namesake of our institution, who looked at Charles Babbage's analytical machine and could see the, um, uh, could see the analogy with the Jacquard loom, which was a weaving machine and essentially a universal machine that could, be, that could run certain programs. And again, only a feminine eye or, or a woman who had exposure to traditionally feminine discourse or, or um, uh, uh, tools and, um, trades such as weaving could look at that and understand it in a new way. So I think those two examples really demonstrate why having a woman in the room and a woman's vision and a woman's sight on everything that's being designed and in law and policy, all aspects of the, the discourse is really essential to opening up new ways of looking at things. Mm -hmm. As the report says, and as Carly just said, having women in the room is the start, and it's mm -hmm. not sufficient. And one of the things that I think is really um, important about this report is it reminds us that the stories we tell about technology are really important for shaping how we think about um, how the technology can be used, how it can be challenged, how it can be adapted. And I, I think this is so true even in these stories as well. If we if we think, for example, the story about automation saying that um, mainly male factory workers will be put out of business, that's a great mm. story. It's a story that has um, animated a lot of the conversation we talk about in the future of work, and yet it's wrong. Um, the recent report from the Office of National Statistics finds that of the jobs at most risk for automation, 70% of them are held by women. Wow. And that's part of the kind of story that we need to start telling. We need, we need to 
we need to scope the problem around the gender dynamics in AI, mm -hmm. not as just we need more women to participate yeah. in AI. We need that. Yeah. But we also need to have a much bigger conversation mm -hmm. about the kinds of organizations we want, the kinds mm -hmm. of companies exactly. we want, the kinds of governance we want, mm -hmm. the, kinds, the kinds of society we want. We mm -hmm. did discuss uh, before the panel the importance of culture and that we need to kind of grow cultures that account for our needs as workers, that we work differently than men, right? And we should extend our um, interests beyond data and models into processes, into cultures and norms to understand what do we need to change to actually foster that culture that's inclusive and diverse. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, even if, if we prepare workforce that diverse, when they actually land a job in an organization, they might not perform to the mm. level we expect because the culture doesn't help them, right? Yeah. So on this note, I mean, for instance, I can't crochet or weave, and I have very little knowledge about how a jacquard loom works. Um, perhaps we should just uh, teach all kids in school how to crochet in case they become mathematicians. Um, but um, on that note, simply, again, putting a woman in the room will not always solve all the problems. We need uh, people in the room who are able to speak to these problems uh, who are preferably experts on exactly these kinds of problems that need to be addressed because not every woman is a gender expert. Um, now, as Sarah and Clemmy pointed out, um, one of the issues is, and, and this is highlighted in a report as well, gender theorists, so experts on gender and AI practitioners don't talk to each other enough. Okay. Now, why do you think that is the case? And what could be done um, to implement that more at every level? I think we have to remember that um, people building and designing AI technologies actually have their hands full right now. I mean, they're, they're working really hard on building technical challenges. And that's not to absolve people involved in industry and research from the really hard and thorny ethical problems. But we can't get to better technologies if we have very siloed conversations where some people are seen as doing the soft side of AI and some people are seen as doing the really hard side of AI. What I find mm -hmm. in my work is that when you open up the space of what's considered design and what's considered technology, you start to find and see all sorts of amazing stories. So case in point, I have a brilliant, uh, now former doctoral student. She became, uh, she got her PhD on Thursday night. <laughs> uh, Samantha Shorey, Sam Shorey. And she did a brilliant um, design workshop at the Computer History Museum in Silicon Valley where she looked at the coding work that took place to make the core memory um, programs that navigated the Apollo missions to the moon. And these core memory, this core memory was woven core memory. It was literally woven wire with um, waft and weft being uh, ones and zeros. And the engineers um, designed the program the um, women, they called them the little old ladies, literally knit the first, this, this massive computer program, this massive core memory to, to power the Apollo missions. So what they did in their design workshop, they literally brought some of the, the engineers into the room and along with the public, along with historians, and they handed them cards and weaving, just like you might get from a child's weaving kit. And they said, okay, here's a, your little bit of code now at 10 times the scale, 10 times larger. See if you can weave a computer program like the quote unquote little old ladies did. And guess what? They failed. But they, what they learned in the process was that that technical skill was just as important as the mathematical components. So we've, we've developed a set of stories about what counts in our technological high society, you know, high advanced, high tech society that some kinds of skills count and others don't. Mm -hmm. Building community, that doesn't really count, even in an economy where we're running things based on um, people in communities. Um, content moderation, content takeout, that doesn't count, 
even though Facebook can't survive without that work. And so I think one of the things we need to do is have a serious reflection on who's doing the work, where they're doing the work, and can we start to recode and recount some of those types of jobs that women are holding as part of what we need in our technologically advanced society. I think it's also important to acknowledge the various diversity programs that a lot of the companies have been running for years. And I think we've been discussing what has changed. First of all, that we had this explosion of AI adoption and 100 million uh, uh, assistant, smart assistant being sold this year alone. Mm -hmm. So that means on one hand, we have the consumerization of, of AI, and also on the other hand, we had the Me Too, right? And then suddenly we get more acknowledgement of the abuses that the women have suffered, you know, starting with the, the city of dreams. And then in this, this context that we actually go through a, a, um, a period of more focus on those programs. But those programs of diversity and inclusion, they need time to produce that culture, going mm. back to what, mm -hmm. what I said earlier. And I think it's on one hand is acknowledging all the efforts are being done from board levels to middle management on fostering diversity and actually bringing the, the, the new consideration on gender into those programs that already exist, almost like piggybacking. I love this expression because I think it helps mm. us you know, benefit from the energy and the focus that's already there. And second, very important <laughs> as like, is how do we translate the great research you guys are doing and how can we bring the decision maker to meet the researchers so that we actually feed this very important uh, um, uh, knowledge into action and you know, groups like CFI and other are the best places to foster this dialogue, to make sure that we have that round and diverse audience like we had for the workshop in February, and make sure that we are connected with people who are on, on, on the ground doing, doing the hard work. Just to pick up on one small thing, which you talked about board representation, I think we need to think also about incentives. What are the incentives for AI companies in particular in the private mm -hmm. sector to bring women's voices into the room? Mm -hmm. Women-founded companies receive 2% of venture capital funding. What incentives are there for those companies to increase representation of women on the boards within the team and amongst founders as well? You know, research shows that women-founded companies receive the same levels of second round mm -hmm. venture capital funding as non-women-founded uh, companies. So there's equal virtue to the products that they're creating, but they don't get that foot in the door in the mm -hmm. first place. And I think we need to change the incentives, and one way to do that is following the money. Mm -hmm. and this reminds me of um, a company which I maybe should not name, um, but which uh, is competing with uh, taxis um, rather controversially, who were looking for um, a female CEO. And uh, the headline last, uh, last week in one of the newspapers was, um, uh, their hunt for a female CEO is down to a short list of four men which was because all of the female candidates that they had approached um, had said no because they did not um, feel incentivized enough to work for this yeah. particular company as CEO. I, I think it's important to start empowering women to be part of the decision maker and not just do um, diversity or uh, uh, you know, address diversity as a tokenism. We have to be honest if we are real about achieving gender bias, we have to start with the board. We have to start empowering women um, to, to, to be at, at the table where big decisions are being made. And also, to build mm -hmm. on what you said, we need measures. So, need. Maria, um, this discussion has been going for a couple of years now. We have been all alerted to the fact that there is a leaky pipeline, that there is lack of diversity. Incentives have been started, um, li lists of principles have been made. What has changed over these past few mm -hmm. years? What has improved, if anything? I think, as I, as I said before, the fact that we have now a focus on diversity is ex excellent. We've seen a flurry of new initiatives uh, run in DWC, but for our, with our clients as well, to address diversity throughout the value chain. So we have a fantastic initiative. I couldn't be more proud to mention it every single time. It's Tech She Can, which is mm -hmm. a Tech She Can charter. Uh, we have 100 organizations that signed to it. It has 
three streams. One addresses uh, the, the policy, and uh, we found that APGG uh, AI on STEM. The second is um, updating the curriculum for schools. But third, which is very important, is role models. Mm -hmm. We should not underestimate the, the role of role models, like all of us in the room, and so many fantastic women, like Jess here, <laughs> Hi, Jess. Uh, to, to, to build our profiles and inspire what young women to step in. And we have a young generation that's waiting to be fostered, to be giving them voice, to be given the power. So I think it's important to, to acknowledge that as well. Um, but then um, we started looking, as I said, from board level, what KPIs we need to have in place and who's accountable for those KPIs how do we measure them across the value chain, in recruitment, in culture, in empowers women to speak? Do you actually know that in meetings, uh, only 20% of the time, women are empowered to speak in regular meetings? Mm -hmm. We have to challenge that. We have to, again, go and say, you know, give women a voice. And mm -hmm. those initiatives have started to pay off. We've seen an increase in number, numbers of partners in PwC from uh, 30 percent, 13 percent in 2003 to 20 percent now. I know it's seven mm -hmm. percent, but I think it's a phenomenal increase. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there are many other examples that will be looking at how do we look throughout the value chain and make sure that every single part is addressed so that we have a sustainable uh, diversity on long term, not just um, small action that produce a bit of impact now, Great. but they are not consistent yes. over time. Great, that's encouraging. Yeah. Maria said earlier this morning that we have to move from um, gender ethics, uh, gender diversity and ethical behavior being simply something that's seen as extra in business to being business as usual. And that's when we'll know that we've made real change. And so while these initiatives are starts, they, they, they help companies, organizations, and, and even society move to places where we can start to change culture and mm -hmm. change attitudes. So one initiative that um, amplifies some of the work that we see in corporate initiatives is a program I'm involved in called the Women's Forum. They have an initiative on AI and gender. And the hope is that we can hold companies accountable, asking them to, as a start, account for their own data processes and practices around gender and AI. So can they actually do internal audits and then share the best practices and results with a group of other partners? So the partners in this initiative include some of the biggest technology companies, Microsoft and Google, but also UNESCO, whose recent report on gender and AI, I think along with the one that Sarah and her team are releasing um, in two weeks, really help pave the way for how we can start to scope the problem of technology either um, repeating and perpetuating these kinds of things we wanna change or being the lever that we use to make that change. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> um, so perhaps this is a question that um, speaks for itself, but I have noticed that there are still a lot of people who need convincing that this is actually important rather than just uh, gender diversity, making things look good. So why is it important for everyone that there is gender parity, diversity, inclusion, and empowerment. And what specifically does that bring to improving AI and its impact and its technology? Well, without being uh, making overblown claims, I think we probably all agree that AI is going to fundamentally change almost every element of society. And I think that there's a real risk that technologies can become rejected by societies unless there is legitimacy for their adoption. And I think building public legitimacy and a social license for AI, both in the private sector and in the public sector, requires buy-in from people across society, and half of those people are women. So I would have thought it's as simple as that. If you need to make a business case for it, I think you can also do that. You can say that you know a particular product is not going to have buy-in by women, it's not going to reflect needs of women, and therefore it's not going to you know find a place in the market. 
Um, and you know, if you need to make that business case, I think it's quite evident as well. But if we think about AI in public institutions, I think you know, the, the success of AI, the adoption of AI is going to depend entirely on whether it has public legitimacy amongst the public, 50% of whom are women. And we have the figures. I mean, we run a research that diversity is not a problem, but a solution. And we've actually demonstrated with numbers that it boosts value creation, mm. innovation, anything. So the, 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 uh, the business Evidence case is there. Is there. Yeah. It's just someone needs to acknowledge it right. and run away with it. Right. It's as simple as it is. So right. I don't mm. think we necessarily need convincing. We need to you know, think about why we're building AI, right? And mm -hmm. we've we, we all believe that AI should be built to help with flourishing of humanity. And humanity has 50% men, 50% women. Therefore, if we want to, everyone to flourish, we have to acknowledge the needs of women as well. So I think we are on the right track, but it's like nine pregnant women cannot give birth to a child in one month, right? <laughs> so I think we have to give it time and actually be a little brave, not necessarily get scared when an algorithm is biased mm -hmm. towards mm -hmm. men, because we need to understand how those solutions work and be able to correct it in, in a positive way, because I think there is a bit of this care element of it, if, it's not, if it's not gender uh, um, uh, balanced, then we should drop the solution and not understand what's wrong with it and how to fix it. We have to be a little bit more positive. We are here, we're going through a major change, not just in terms of the, the, the binary gender. We have a different view on many of the traditional values of society, and that takes time. Now, I, I remember that um, I read yesterday on Twitter something that uh, Einstein said uh, for the 20th century. It's so sad that we can smash an atom, but we can't smash prejudices. Guess what? 21st century is going to be so different because look at how much progress we have made in the last five years alone. So. Mm -hmm. And if we don't continue to make that progress, I fear we're going to have a society where we don't trust women. I think that's what the stakes are. Are we going to build a society where information, data, built primarily around a very small, powerful group in society, sets the terms of the debate for everybody else? and everybody else is an anomaly outside of that norm. And so what our role is now, I think, everyone in this room, is to, is to join in in a charge that ensures that by design, we are building technologies that serve the needs of all people across the gender spectrum. And could you elaborate on that, uh, trusting women? Um, so is this that people don't um, believe women as authorities? Is that a status question? Or? Well, if we think about how AI is rolling out in a data-saturated world, we're seeing um, how we trust certain kinds of information will shift. And I know later um, in this conference on this stage, we're going to have conversations about deep fakes. We're going to have conversations about, again, content moderation, about other kinds of ethical challenges. Are we building a world in which um, people who see serious challenges or ethical issues with data and information are disempowered by the technologies that are around them? I fear when we see numbers like the ones that came out from ONS that show that women disproportionately hold the jobs, the frontline service and retail sector jobs that are at risk for automation, we're seeing the loss of a lot of rich on the ground knowledge about how the world works at risk for something that's relatively shallow. Digital knowledge built from systems that overwhelmingly privilege male, white, northern kinds of knowledge rather than what we see around the world and a better reflection of humanity. Mm -hmm. So um, the report calls for uh, the future of work to be um, intersectional, interdisciplinary, collaborative, international and, and I guess that's most relevant for this panel, tr uh, transsectoral. And how can we um, collaborate between different sectors uh, to address those issues that remain? I'll jump in with one quick suggestion, which is I, I'm questioning the extent to which ethics should be in a different room or in a, on a different stage than conversations on AI. And I think it's great that it's here, it's a starting point, but 
we need to force these conversations onto the people that don't want to have them mm -hmm. and not onto self-selecting audiences that are interested in them. And I'm not <laughs> trying to be overly provocative yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> or critical. I think having an ethics stage is a, a great step, but I'm worried that the right people aren't in this room. Mm -hmm. The work that my team's been doing really shows that if we want to build better data science and AI products, we have to bring social science and humanities knowledge into the core of that work, and that we don't get to better design, better technology design, without better understanding of people. We have a lot of people in the world who understand people, um, including people themselves. I know that sounds recursive, uh, but but that's I think partly broadening out the conversation about about building better tech that we have to have. I agree with Carly. You know, ethics for AI should be DAU, business as usual. That's it. End mm -hmm. of story. Uh, so we don't have this stage next year because all AI is going to be ethical. But in order to get there, there's a bit of work to be done. And I'll continue saying I'm keeping my hopes high that we need to find that dialogue to translate the amazing work that research has, has been doing for the decision makers so that we make sure that whatever is actionable is addressed now when those solutions are being adopted. And the adoption of AI, it's going to surprise us all. I mean, my data science team keep on telling me, it's like, we are surprised how quickly those solutions come, come, come to life. Mm -hmm. But again, 100 mm -hmm. million smart um, assistants being, being sold with 200 next year. So I think that shows you that uh, 200 million, uh, that shows you that Ooh. we don't have a lot of time, that AI is here, so we need to be mm -hmm. acting on all the, the, the um, uh, research is being done in one way or another. Mm -hmm. And you guys, CFI, ADA, again, great places to have those conversations, and I encourage all of you to be part of those conversations and provide feedback and insight, because we need you. We need to build it together, right? This is, we're not building an ivory tower. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so we have come to the end of this panel, and um, the main takeaway is, of course, next month uh, the AI and gender report will be uh, published um, mid-July. Uh, do have a look. It's going to. Uh, it's it's a vastly encompassing and encouraging report, uh, shaping what the field of AI and gender should be doing for the next uh, coming years. I also love that other takeaways uh, from this panel are A, that we should all learn to knit, crochet and weave, <laughs> and B, that uh, we should uh, all not be here um, next year. Um, next year, um, we do, do indeed hope that all AI will be ethical. And meanwhile, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you.